This lecture is about OpenCL runtime and concurrency model. We're going to start with the OpenCL commands and the queuing model. And we will talk about multiple command queues. And after that, we're going to uh, look into more about the OpenCL kernels, work items, and work groups. And finally, we're going to talk about native kernels and built-in kernels. So first, OpenCL commands and the queuing model. We uh, spent quite some time talking about uh, OpenCL, uh, the history of it, and also the general concept in OpenCL computing. OpenCL is a task parallel host controlled model. And kernel is the way that OpenCL performs task parallel. And uh, we also spent uh, quite some time looking at the APIs uh, the OpenCL framework has, and most of them are called from the host side. So that's why it's re it, we refer to it as a host controlled model. Each of the OpenCL tasks is a parallel, which means that for the same task, uh, at one given, uh, at any given time, the task uh, actually performs a computation on multiple set of data. Uh, each of the devices has a command queue, and these command queues are thread safe. Uh, thread safe is an important concept, uh, especially when you have uh, multiple software threads running on the host, and these threads may or may not operate on the same command queue. And in this case, uh, thread safe is important. Kernels, data movement, and other operations uh, are the important parts of OpenCL. And these operations are enqueued onto a specific queue uh, with an asynchronous operation. Uh, these enqueue operations could be uh, asynchronous, and the queue itself could be uh, asynchronous or um, well, could be in order or out of order. These operations are put into the queues, and they are executed at some point in the future. The synchronization among these operations occurs at a specific point. Uh, they occur between commands in a host command queue and between commands in a device side command queue. Uh, in today's lecture, we are not going to spend more time on device side command queue, uh, which will uh, have a separate lecture and, and looking into that. Command synchronization points. So command is the uh, smallest unit that um, host uh, interact with the device. The completion of a command is guaranteed only at a command queue synchronization point. And these synchronization points, including, um, for example, waiting for the completion of a specific OpenCL event, uh, this is done by using the number of events and event list argument in some of the APIs. The other case uh, for the synchronization is the CL flush. This is caught from the host and it tries to block the host execution until an entire queue completes its execution. Also, the other synchronization point is the execution of a blocking memory operation, uh, which we'll see an uh, uh, example. For blocking memory operation, this is mostly commonly used uh, as a synchronization method, especially when you have uh, data transfers uh, between the host and the device. It tries to block the host execution until the memory operation is completed. Um, for example, if the host needs to access data that are residing on the device, for example, in the global memory of the device, and we need to read the data from the device to the host in order for the host to do post-processing or just simply print out the result onto the screen. In this case, a blocking memory operation makes a lot of sense because you have to uh, wait until all the data are uh, read from the device before you can perform your post operation. Uh, 
uh, here uh, we use a blocking read argument in uh, these uh, in queue APIs. We have example here. This is CL in queue read buffer. And this API tries to read data from the device to the host. It takes a series of uh, arguments, uh, for example, command queue, um, buffer, blocking read. And this blocking read is a Boolean flag. And when you set it this as a true, or CL underscore true, this will set this API as a blocking read. Uh, so this memory operation will block until it uh, completes the read operation. And also from this API, you can see that we can optionally wait for other events using the number of events and the event list. And this is another way to set up a synchronization point. We will see more examples uh, of these events uh, shortly. So events are used to specify dependencies between commands. Uh, these are quite useful because uh, oftentimes you have multiple commands, uh, including data transfer uh, and uh, computation, and some other data transfer and some other computation. So this uh, whole operation and interaction could be fairly complex. A lot of the CL in queue APIs can allow you to uh, either generate events representing the status of the command or take an event list specifying the dependencies that must be completed. And of course, you can do both. Um, the possible status of a command is interesting here. The events generated from these uh, API calls uh, actually reflects the status of a command. For example, uh, we have a list of status that could be associated with a command at any uh, given time. Uh, it could be queued, uh, which is the very beginning of this uh, command. And it could be submitted, which refers to the fact that uh, this command has to uh, you know, go from the host side and submit it to the device side. And the next status is ready which means the command is ready to be launched uh, on the device. Running, uh, of course, means that the command is being executed. Uh, ended, meaning this command has completed its uh, execution on the device. However, there's a minor difference between ended and complete, uh, especially for the case that you have uh, child commands that spawn from this uh, current command. The command is considered complete when all the children commands are completed. So that's basically the final status of a command. So we talked about event. Event is a way to set up uh, dependencies. And also, event can tell you a lot more information that a command itself cannot reveal directly. API calls that we have seen so far, uh, they cannot return the error conditions or profiling data of a command. Uh, this is simply because uh, the commands that you submit uh, using CL in queue, um, these are put into the command queue in an asynchronous manner. So it's basically fired off this command to the queue, and it's up to the queue how and when it will handle the command and eventually get the results done. Now, if we want to know more about a command, uh, we can uh, query the event associated with the command. Remember, in the NQ uh, API, uh, we have the option to generate an event uh, that associated with this command. And if we do that, then we can use um, a CL get event info, which is a separate API. Uh, and we can query the information about this event. And in turn, we will know more about the command that associated with this event. So this API is uh, like this. It's called CL get event info. We give the event uh, object, and we can set up a parameter name 
uh, which refers to the properties we want to query about that event. So in this example, we can pass CL event command execution status uh, to this parameter name. And the return value uh, will be uh, presented uh, in the form of the uh, parameter value size and the actual parameter value. Um, and in this way, we can uh, then query the return value to figure out uh, what is the status of this event? And related to the event, uh, we can block host execution. Uh, we can do CL wait for events. So this is for um, synchronizing the host with these uh, AQ synchronized commands. And remember, in the CL inQ APIs, we have a um, number of wait events and the wait event list. And that's for um, the uh, kind of synchronization between different commands. Whereas for synchronizing the host, you can call this CL wait for event API on the host. Uh, so the host will block and waiting for a specific event to happen. Battery operations and markers. So battery operation is a kind of a special uh, command uh, per se that we can use uh, to provide a method of synchronization in an out of order queue. For in order queues, um, things are very simple. Everything uh, happens in the order that uh, it was um, put into the queue. Uh, however, for performance optimization, and we want to have some flexibility uh, in scheduling different commands within the queue. In that case, we uh, create the queue to be an out-of-order queue. This is where the barrier operation um, becomes interesting. Barrier operation will cause anything executing from the queue before the barrier to complete before activities after the queue can continue. So essentially, you can think about this barrier is a special command that is inserted into the queue and everything that you put in before the queue can be uh, executed out of order but this barrier operation is the synchronization point before you can go beyond this point to execute the other commands in the queue. Uh, this barrier uh, itself includes no state and does not support an event of its own, but it sits in the queue uh, to guarantee the ordering um, before and after. Uh, essentially, it's a it's a you know a division point or it's a, it's a barrier point that before the barrier everything uh, can be made in, out of order, but they have to complete uh, altogether um, before we can move on to, onto the things that uh, are after this barrier. And the uh, API for inserting this barrier is CL in queue barrier with waitlist. Markers are similar, uh, but they do not block execution. So markers is, is really a marker. Uh, you can have a marker uh, into put into the queue using CL in queue marker with waitlist. And all the preceding commands have completed and the marker completes. So it's an implicit input event you list with events for all preceding commands. So it will notify, or we can use it to figure out whether all the preceding commands have completed or not. The output event of a marker is explicit. And that's why we want this marker to uh, notify uh, the uh, completion status of all the preceding commands. And using this uh, output event of the marker we can use to trigger further activity. Now we can uh, use event to uh, check other information about the command, for example error conditions. Uh, we can use uh, CL get event info to query the event uh, about uh, the um, you know the 
the queue uh, associated with it, the command, and also the command type. And also, we can um, query the uh, execution status. For the command type, uh, it will return uh, one of these following values. Uh, so essentially, we can figure out what exactly this command is, is doing uh, by checking this uh, type. For example, if it's uh, an ND range kernel, or is a simple task, or is this command uh, doing a writing on a buffer. Additionally, and more importantly, in fact, that we can apply profiling uh, within the context. So the timing information can be obtained by uh, using this uh, event info. And we're going to uh, talk more about that in later classes. Event callbacks. Event callbacks are of special functions that are invoked when events reach specific states. And callback functions uh, will be uh, triggered or uh, invoked when the specific execution status of a command uh, in a queue um, occurs. Uh, typically, the way we use it is to uh, we will uh, you know in queue uh, new commands uh, and we will uh, set the uh, trigger event to be submitted uh, or running or complete and these are the callback types so this callback types basically says that when do we expect this callback function to be invoked uh, are we gonna call this function when the command is submitted or uh, if the command is running or if the command is complete. The API uh, is uh, like this. We do CL set event callback. Uh, of course, we'll give the uh, event object as the first argument. And we will specify the callback type, uh, which is one of the three. And then we will give the uh, prototype of the callback function. Uh, there's a specific way to define the callback function. And uh, also, it has a fixed um, number of uh, arguments uh, to that callback function. And optionally, we can provide user data uh, so the callback function uh, can use. Here's the callback example. Uh, so what we're looking at here is a uh, host-based library uh, that the callback function can use. But everything starts actually from here. So this is open OpenCL application. This is what we have uh, in main.c, and we will have uh, you know all these uh, platform and device uh, query, and then set up the context, create the command queues that are associated with devices, and we will uh, of course uh, create command uh, and put that into the command queue by using CL in queue functions, and. When we define the callback function uh, here, we can set up in a way that uh, we can say, first of all, uh, we want uh, this callback function to get uh, invoked when the kernel event reaches CL complete. So we can say that uh, we will um, have the uh, callback type as CL complete. And when at runtime, when the um, status of the command reaches to CL complete, this callback function will be triggered. Within the callback function, you can use um, you know, the resources or libraries functions uh, on the host. So you, you can call uh, a subroutine here. But the um, expectation is that this callback function should be very simple. Uh, it should not be uh, a blocking um, function. Uh, it should be completed uh, as quickly as possible. And this callback function can perform its work, then will um, you know, provide uh, necessary data output uh, so that the CL, OpenCL application can leverage or even um, just simply print out the result. And it does matter when to set the callback function. Uh, let me show you an example. So let's say we have a uh, event object. It's called completion event. Uh, 
Um, so once we declare this completion event as an event object, um, you know you have the you know tendency to set up the callback function. So if you do like this, I'll you know, call CL set event callback. Uh, the event object is the completion event, and the callback type is CL complete. And this is my callback function declared uh, somewhere else before, and this is the argument we want to pass uh, into this callback function. This is actually an incorrect location to set callback, because think about this: you just declared a completion event, but this completion event is really not a valid event yet because there's no one or no uh, any uh, command that is associated with this event. So if you call the CL set event callback API here, right after you declare the completion event, the API actually will return an invalid event um, error. OK, so let's move on to see how we should actually set this in a correct way. So let's assume that you are going to enqueue a kernel into the command queue. So that you're calling CL enqueue ND range kernel. You give the command queue. You give the kernel object. You set up the global uh, work size and local work size. And you specify the uh, return event, or the event associated with this kernel uh, is completion event. So that's good news. At this point, you now have a valid event. So right after this uh, CL in queue and range kernel, you can set up the callback function. And this is the correct location to set this callback function. Um, and of course, you can just simply do the same thing, CL set event callback, but the correct location should be here. Uh, there are a few things you need to uh, keep in mind when using callback functions. Um, if you have multiple callback functions, um, you, there's no guarantee on the execution order of these functions on the same event. Um, you have to be careful. You know, If you require some orders, then uh, you may want to put them into the same callback function or do something different. Callback functions should be threat safe. Uh, you don't expect to modify any shared um, variables uh, that could uh, cause uh, issues with other threats. And you should also keep in mind that these callback functions will be called asynchronously because there's uh, no um, prediction that when your command will be completed or will be enqueued. And you also uh, need to uh, be careful about the uh, actual operations in this callback function. You cannot call expensive uh, system routines, for example, you know, uh, perform large uh, number of uh, data writes to a SD card, uh, which can take uh, a long time, uh, or uh, calling some blocking API, uh, such as CL finish. In general, callback functions should be and very lightweighted, uh, and um, you can use stop to call more complex functions, um, maybe fire off a different thread, uh, but itself should be uh, complete uh, very quickly. We mentioned about profiling. Profiling is very useful, especially in the performance tuning stage. Uh, we can do profiling using events. We can uh, determine the execution status or time of a command expressed uh, through events. Uh, because events can associate with um, the command, and you can determine the status of the command uh, by doing the query. And you can record each state uh, and its associated uh, the timestamp or timer value. Uh, and this way, you know how much time this command is in the uh, ready stage, or how much time it has been waiting in the semi submitted stage, and actually how much time it used for doing the actual computation. In order to do this, we need to enable profiling. 
uh, we will set the CLQ profiling enable flag in the properties uh, when you call CL create command queue with properties. Uh, and this is the API that you can use to create a queue. And that time, you need to say, I want profiling enabled in this queue. Once you have that enabled, uh, so this queue can provide you this information. And then you can use the following profiling API to uh, get the, um, the information about this event. For example, uh, Oh, this API shows that first we need to give the event object and also we need to do profiling um, parameters and this parameter name could be um, many and we have two examples here you can say I uh, one parameter is uh, profiling command start and the and then the parameter value size and parameter value uh, these two will give you the um, the actual value that's returned from this profiling API. For example, uh, if you have a, a start, profiling command start, and this uh, parameter value size will be set to the timestamp size, uh, which is 32 bits, and the return value will be a timestamp uh, in, I believe, in microseconds, and um, you will now have the starting timestamp. And the second time when you call this profiling API, uh, even profiling info, you can supply CL profiling command end uh, as the parameter name. So in that API, you will be able to retrieve the ending time of the command. And with these two values, you can do a simple subtraction that will give you the execution time of this command. A little bit more about events. Uh, in the previous several slides, well, we focused on the uh, commands associated, sorry, the events uh, associated with the commands. Um, here we can um, expand that into so called user events. So, user events uh, do not have to be associated with a specific uh, command that you put into the queue. Um, and you can really use user events uh, in some arbitrary way. So let's look at example here. We can declare a event object, user event, and we actually create a user event using CL create user event, give the context zero. Um, and we can say, um, well, first of all, this user event is not generated or associated with a previous command. And with this user event, we can do something like this. We can do CL in queue read buffer. Now you know this is to put a read operation or read command into the queue. And we can say that uh, we want the um, read command to wait for, this is a number of events we want to wait, to wait for one event. And this event is user event. And this is the user event we just created on the host. This user event is not associated with a previous command uh, enqueued into the command queue. So that's the major difference uh, between this user event and other conventional command associated with uh, events. Um, and here we don't uh, we put zero, which means that we do not want this read buffer to generate the event. Well, we don't need that. So what happens here is uh, this read buffer, this command will be put into the queue. However, it's going to be uh, blocking. It's going to be waiting for this particular user event, just like it's supposed to wait for other uh, event as well because the way we set it up or because the way we call this API, we are waiting for this user event. And in fact, we want we specifically wait for this user event to become uh, complete. And of course, we'll do other things, but until this user event uh, becomes uh, you know, complete, see how complete, we will not um, you know, see this read operation to proceed. So 
really the way to use the user event is at some point later, you want this um, user event to become complete. So we'll do CL set user event status, user event comma CL complete. And when this is uh, called, this user event of course becomes CL complete. And then this read buffer now gets the um, event that it has been waiting for, and it will then proceed on execution, executing the read operation. So what's uh, important here is to know that this user event can be created arbitrarily, and you can use it as if it is an event associated with the previous command. Uh, but for this user event, you need to explicitly set the event status. Auto folder command queue is uh, different from the in order command queue. Um, and when you create a command queue, it is in order by default. So in that case, the commands that you in queue to this command queue will be executed in the order they are in queued. And for most cases, this may uh, work, uh, but you know, in order for getting high performance, uh, we want some flexibility in the order of these commands being executed. Uh, that's where we uh, would require the queue to be created as an out of order queue. For example, uh, if there are uh, multiple commands and one of them is doing DMA data transfer and the other one is doing computation, and if there's no conflicts, uh, no dependencies, then these two commands can actually be uh, executed uh, in, um, in parallel in the sense that they don't have to be uh, executed one after another. So we want the OpenCL runtime to have the capability to do this kind of optimization for achieving better performance. Uh, we, we can choose an out-of-order queue or setting up the queue as an out-of-order when we create the queue. Uh, the flag we use is this one, CL queue out of order, execution mode enable. Let's look at this uh, concrete example. Um, as you can see here, we first uh, basically set up this property uh, as a command queue property object. And we use this property uh, in calling the CL create command queue with properties. And of course, we'll specify the context and the device we want to create this command queue for. And in this example, we declare several events. Write event, kernel event 0, kernel event 1, and read event. And we're creating buffers uh, for holding data. And we have this input um, data buffer, and it's read-only. And then we have this Im intermediate uh, buffer object. Uh, it's a uh, read slash write, so we can do read both read and write operation on this data buffer. And both of them are uh, floating point, 32 uh, floating point numbers. And the output buffer is created as a write-only and uh, the same size. So what we're going to see here is actually um, a few commands we will put into the command queue. So here the first one uh, is in queue write buffer. In queue write buffer will put a write operation into the command queue. Uh, by write operation, we actually mean that we will um, need to copy the data uh, from the host side to the device side. And this uh, is the size of the buffer. And CL false means that we're not going to do blocking. So this write uh, operation is a non-blocking operation. And the um, 
input here is actually the um, buffer object we initialized and the host input contains the actual input data on the host side. So this write buffer operation is going to copy 32 floating point numbers from this host input buffer to this input, uh, which is the memory buffer on the device. And pay attention here, we have this write event as the last argument of this uh, write buffer API. This is to say that we want to associate this write event, this is the event object, with this write buffer command. So when this write buffer command is completed, this event will be set CL complete. And we're not going to wait for any other events. Uh, that's uh, how why we set here 0 and now. And then we set up the execution unit dimension. We're using one dimension um, kernel and we set local size to be 8 and global size to be 32. And the next few lines from 30 to 34 we are going to enqueue the first kernel. And the kernel object is kernel, and it takes three arguments here, uh, index 0, 1, and 2. And the first two arguments are the um, memory buffer. Uh, this is the input, and this is the intermediate. Um, so, and the third argument is the size uh, of the buffer. So essentially what we're doing here is that we are um, you know, uh, sorry, the, 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 um, the line after this set a kernel argument is the CL ND range kernel. And we are enqueuing this kernel function to this queue. And we are using one dimensional um, for both the global and local. And we are going to wait for one event, which is the right event. So recall this write event is this uh, event generated from the write buffer command. And the output event of this um, enqueue and range kernel is this kernel event 0. What essentially this uh, means is that uh, we would like to uh, run this kernel, uh, but the condition is when this write event is complete. And that is to say, we actually gonna wait for the completion of write buffer command before we um, launch this ND range kernel. So the kernel can be enqueued, but it cannot be executed until this um, write buffer command is completed. And the output event of this first kernel uh, function is the kernel event zero. So this event going to be CL complete uh, when this kernel function is completed. Similarly, uh, we set the kernel arguments uh, for the second kernel. Uh, also, we uh, use the same uh, dimension size, global size and local size. And the event I'm waiting for is this kernel event 0, which is this one. And we are going to uh, generate a new event, which is a kernel event one. Okay. And so if we um, do this, then you know once these two kernel functions are completed, we expect to read output data. So we will do inq read buffer, and we're gonna use the uh, output buffer as the source uh, to read from and we will uh, read the data and put it into host output buffer this is the buffer on the host side and we will uh, wait for the kernel event one which is generated by the second time you call the kernel and the uh, event generated by this read buffer command is this read event and finally we will, uh, on the host side, we'll wait for events. We're going to uh, wait for one event, that is the read event, uh, which indicates uh, that we uh, read the final result from the device to the host. And after that, we'll do some cleanup. So in this example, what we can see here is 
we actually have four commands, write buffer, uh, kernel 1, kernel 2. Now note that this kernel 1, kernel 2, although they are the same kernel function, but they're actually uh, two separate commands. And the fourth command uh, is this read buffer. So altogether, we have these four commands in the queue. And this queue is an uh, out of order queue. And the way we uh, set up dependency uh, on these commands uh, is this using these events. So write event is generated from the write buffer and is uh, being waited on by the first uh, kernel function. Uh, similarly, the second kernel function waits on the kernel event generated from the first kernel function. And finally, the read buffer command waits on the kernel event generated by the second kernel function. All right, so we have several uh, questions that we want to ask here to get you uh, think more. So first question is, what happens if we swap uh, CL in queue write buffer with the first uh, CL in queue and D range kernel. So what we're saying here is uh, we will uh, swap this one with this one. Okay, so that means we are putting these two um, commands into the queue in a different order. So the and uh, in queue ND range kernel will be called first, and then CL in queue write buffer will be called next, well, after this uh, first kernel launch. Would that be okay? The answer is yes, because the queue is an out of order queue. So it does not really matter which. Um, in queue command you call both of these two commands write buffer and uh, ND range kernel both of these two commands will be in the queue and they will be uh, executed as soon as possible and out of these two write buffer will be executed because it's not waiting for any other event and even though this first uh, in queue uh, ND range kernel is put before the write buffer, this kernel will not be uh, actually executed because it is waiting for this write event. Only after this write event uh, is becoming complete, this first uh, ND range kernel can then be launched and executed. So the answer to the first question is, it's OK. Uh, you can swap this uh, ND range kernel in queue with this uh, write buffer command. Now, if we swap that, then my next question is, what if we use an in-order queue? So what we're saying is, let's go back to the previous uh, page. So when we not setting this property, we will create a in-order queue by default. In that case, if we swap this ND range kernel, this one, with this write buffer, then we're going to have a problem. When we call this CL in queue ND range kernel, before we call this CL in queue write buffer, so this command is putting the queue first. This write buffer is putting the queue second. Now, because this ND range kernel is waiting on this write event, so it will stuck there because this write event is not CL complete. And because this CL in queue write buffer is putting the queue after this ND range kernel, so this one, this command will not be executed. As a result, this write event will never become CL complete. So there's a deadlock 
uh, in this situation. So in this case, this program will just uh, stop. A few words about multiple command queues. For multiple devices in a system, uh, for example, you may have a CPU, a GPU, uh, or FPGA, or even multiple GPUs and multiple FPGAs. Each device needs its own command queue. Now, um, we also want to mention here is, it's also possible to have multiple command queues for a single device. Uh, it's not commonly used uh, although it's possible uh, and that is um, where we need to be uh, extra careful uh, when you know to schedule or how to schedule commands uh, from multiple queues on a device and we will not talk um, you know more about that uh, case but in general multiple devices uh, using OpenCL uh, we typically uh, use two different execution models, uh, assuming that each uh, device has one command queue. And these two execution models are uh, pipeline or uh, in parallel. And we're going to see more examples um, of explaining these two different models. But in general, the pipeline manner, even though we, you have two or more devices, one device will wait for the result uh, from another device. That's uh, how we form a pipeline. In contrast, uh, when you want multiple devices to work independently, in parallel, uh, in this devices, in this sorry, in this scenario, um, both devices use their own buffers and will uh, execute independently. This diagram shows the example of multiple command queues in a context. On this OpenCL platform, we have two devices. Device zero is a GPU. Device one is a CPU and we create separate command queues for these two devices. So what you see here is this is the command queue for device 0 and we call it the um, queues GPU and here this is uh, the command queue for device 1 we call it a uh, queue CPU. And these two command queues they may have different commands inserted for example, we have a kernel 0 inserted into this uh, queue GPU, and we have kernel 1 inserted to this uh, uh, queue CPU. And they could be running at different uh, uh, execution stages, and they could be accessing uh, shared resources, for example, some data in the memory buffer, and so they may have some interactions or dependencies. But overall, we're showing that in this diagram, we have multiple command queues within a context, and each command queue is serving to a specific device. And here's the uh, implementation uh, in OpenCL. So we're declaring two uh, devices, and we use CL get device IDs to um, get information of the device. One is CPU type, one is a GPU type. And then we create a context including both devices. Uh, so there's a CL create context uh, two devices. And after that, we'll create command queues for each of them. And we declare queue CPU and queue GPU. And we uh, call CL create command queue with properties. Uh, so we have a command queue created for device zero, which is the CPU device. So the queue name is queue. CPU. Similarly, we have a queue GPU uh, queue object created for the GPU device. Using these two command queues, we can perform two different execution models. 
Uh, let's look at the first one, pipeline model. So in this example, uh, we have kernel 0 enqueued to uh, the GPU's queue, and we have kernel 1 enqueued to the uh, CPU's command queue. And these two kernels, uh, they share uh, some memory objects, some data in the memory buffer. So what's happening here in this example is uh, both kernel 0 and kernel 1 are enqueued uh, respectively to their queues, and the kernel 0 uh, is running first. And kernel 0 is running uh, on the GPU device and it's accessing data in the memory buffer and so the computation is uh, ongoing. At the same time, uh, even though kernel 1 is enqueued, but kernel 1 has to wait. And it'll wait until the completion of kernel 0, uh, maybe for the purpose of you know, the kernel 1 is waiting for the result from kernel 0 before it can move on to the next uh, computation. And this point is where the kernel 0 is completed, so the result is ready, and then kernel 1 is uh, uh, active again, so it will um, move on to the execution phase, uh, so kernel 1 becomes running, uh, it's going to access the data in the um, memory buffer and uh, the computation is finally com complete. And this is the implementation for this pipeline model. We can see here we are using uh, events. We have event CPU and event GPU. We call the first CL NQ ND range kernel and note here we are putting this kernel onto the GPU queue. So we're using Q underscore GPU. And of course, the kernel is the GPU kernel. And we set up the uh, global and the local size. And most importantly, we will uh, generate this event GPU. Event GPU uh, is the event associated with this uh, kernel command. And it will become CL complete once this kernel uh, is uh, completed its execution. The second API call is CL NQ ND range kernel, uh, and this is now the CPU queue. And of course, this corresponding CPU kernel. We also set up the global size and local size, and we now say we will wait for one event, and the event is GPU uh, event underscore GPU, which is exactly the same as the event that will be uh, eventually set by the GPU kernel. And the last argument here is event CPU, so that's the event will be generated um, by the um, CPU kernel upon its completion. Because this wait list, so this CPU kernel will wait until the completion of the GPU kernel. And that's exactly what we want to happen as illustrated in the previous diagram. So note the uh, uh, comments here. Uh, it's saying exactly that. Uh, the CPU kernel will start after event GPU is on CL complete. Now we're looking at a different uh, execution model, which is the parallel model. Parallel model refers to the fact that uh, some of the tasks, if there are no uh, required dependencies and you want these kernels to be running uh, in parallel so that you can achieve the uh, highest performance. And we're seeing here uh, actually three devices, device 0, device 1, and device 2. Both device 0 and device 1 are GPU devices and device 2 is a CPU device. And we have separate command queues for these three devices. Uh, we have queue for device 0, the GPU queue, and we have another queue for device 1, another GPU, and we have a queue for device 2, which is a CPU. And we have kernels uh, launched to these uh, individual queues, kernel 0, kernel 1, kernel 2. 
Now in this case, what we actually want to do is we want kernel 0 and kernel 1 to be running uh, in parallel. Uh, because, you know, for this case, we do not have any dependencies between these two kernels. And um, before CPU kernel, kernel 2, uh, we want this CPU kernel 2 to be waiting for the completion of kernel 1. So even though kernel Q is in queued, uh, this kernel 2 is not being executed until the completion of kernel 1, which is at this point. So this is just one example uh, that we want to build this kind of execution model so that kernel 0 and kernel 1 can execute in parallel and are executing in parallel while kernel 2 is waiting for the completion of kernel 1. So next, let's look at how this can be done in OpenCL. So we'll uh, create a kernel event, sorry, event objects. We have two GPU events. And we first have two inq and derange kernel API calls. And both of these calls are for GPU queues. And the first API call is for creating a GPU kernel, uh, actually inqueuing a GPU kernel into uh, GPU 0 so queue. And the second API call is to inqueue a kernel uh, into the queue GPU 1. So these are two separate GPU queues. And as you can see here, for both of these two API calls, we do not wait for any other events. So they two, these two kernels will be in queue and then uh, launched immediately onto the device and then being executed. For these two APIs, we have events generated from them, and this events underscore GPU zero is generated from the uh, kernel on device zero, and this one is generated from device one. The third API call, uh, another in queue and derange kernel, we're gonna launch the kernel on the CPU queue, and we're using a CPU kernel. Now here, we want to uh, wait for the events from the GPUs. Uh, sorry, I think I misspoken when I explained the diagram. We actually want the CPU to wait on both uh, GPU kernels. So we're waiting for uh, the completion of both uh, GPU kernels. And uh, we do not generate events uh, upon completion. So these several lines uh, implement the dependencies uh, between the GPU kernels and CPU kernel, but also allows the uh, GPU kernels, two of them, to execute in parallel. Next, we're going to talk about um, CL, OpenCL kernel. Next, we're going to talk about OpenCL kernels, work items, work groups, and ND range. We talked uh, many times about kernel. OpenCL's execution is concentrated on the concept of a kernel. Kernel is a single execution instance. So we define the operations in the kernel function. But when we execute it at runtime, kernel is a execution instance. And there could be kernels running on different devices at the same time. Work item is the single kernel instance in OpenCL terminology. Uh, and kernel instance or work item defines just one sliver of a large parallel execution space. I think it is important to understand that a work item is just a one copy or one instance of the functions or the instructions or computation you want to perform on certain uh, unit of data. And when the kernel function is mapped to the hardware model of OpenCL, each work item runs on a unit of the hardware, abstractly known as a processing element. 
Recall that we have a device concept, and on the device, we may have multiple computer units. Within a computer unit, there could be multiple processing element. So processing element is the smallest unit uh, on the hardware uh, that OpenCL provides as an abstraction. Each processing element may process multiple work items. Uh, depends on the actual architecture of the processing element. Uh, for example, uh, SMD architecture in GPU cores, and it can uh, process multiple work items uh, on the same processing element. This could be done in parallel fashion or in a pipeline fashion, depends on the hardware uh, organization. The synchronization between work items is not defined, therefore each work item executes independently. This is where the OpenCL has its advantage. You can allow multiple work items uh, to execute independently uh, as a way to scale the performance up. Work groups is a n-dimensional set of work items in a global execution space. Uh, and this work groups, you can think about this is a, a larger a group of work than the work items. So you can group a certain set of work items into this work group. And when we map this work group into onto the hardware, we actually map to a compute unit. Uh, recall the concept again, we have a compute unit on a device, and in each of the compute unit, we have processing element. So work items corresponds to work, um, sorry, processing element, and work groups corresponds to compute unit. And the difference between work groups and work items not only you know is on the scale, uh, but also uh, work groups uh, allows for local synchronization uh, by concurrent execution. Um, what this means is that. For items within the work group, even though they can, uh, they are able to execute independently, they can also um, have certain synchronization, if necessary, if needed. And this is very useful when you want to um, allow certain parallelism, a uh, degree of parallelism in terms of execution. At the same time, you require some uh, exchange of data or some synchronization point uh, among these uh, smaller compute uh, tasks. And we'll see more examples in later lectures. But just uh, keep in mind that uh, there's possibility of doing local synchronization within work groups to achieve some more complex uh, workloads. For larger and more heavily threaded devices, define larger dispatches uh, that can execute concurrently. This is the key point of scaling out uh, or scalability in OpenCL framework. Um, you can um, map uh, one work item to a processing element. And you can map multiple uh, work items as a work group onto a compute unit. So there's a um, possibly a mismatch between the number of work items and the number of processing elements uh, in a compute unit. Issuing more work on a compute unit than it can handle will cause uh, some resource contention. So if let's say you have a compute unit that has eight processing element, and you are launching um, 16 work items onto this compute unit, there is a chance that they cannot be mapped to all these eight units at a given time. So they might be, um, you know, take turns or uh, form a second batch to map the remaining eight work items onto this eight processing element. Um, so the challenge here, or the trick here, is that you want to issue just enough work that can run concurrently. 
if you issue just enough work and you will be able to keep the all the processing elements busy all the time and also you can finish the work groups uh, in one batch so that's the goal In a finer scale, um, work items can be grouped into a smaller number of hardware threads or context. Um, it's a little different from the SMD. Um, the SMD shares uh, program counters that you can execute one instruction on all the uh, data at the same time. But work items here, uh, it's, you know, it's more dependent. Um, than the hardware threading because work items are supposed to maintain their own program counters. When mapping work items, uh, the dispatch from OpenCL framework uh, should be a even multiple of devices uh, width. Um, and for example, uh, if the, you're using an AMD wave, uh, GPU, and the GPU has 64 wave front, uh, or uh, in terms of the NVIDIA term terminology, it's the uh, WAP, um, you know, um, and then you can um, try to match these uh, work items uh, into these uh, wave front or WAP, and try to define you know, how big a scale your work item should be designed for um, you know, fulfill or take full advantage of these uh, GPU uh, processing elements. You can uh, query these kind of information uh, by using CL get kernel work group info uh, to find out uh, what is the you know uh, most appropriate multiple that you can use to um, try to fill up the processing elements as much as possible. We mentioned at the beginning that the work item is a execution instance. Um, so each of the execution instance, the work item is actually working on different parts or different elements of the complete problem set. So it's important to understand the uh, dimension so you know uh, what is the uh, size of the problem and what is the current element uh, that you are working on in terms of the um, data set. Here are some of the uh, built-in functions you can use to understand the problem dimension, to understand the global size and local size, and more importantly, to get the global ID and the local ID uh, so that you can calculate uh, as an index to find out what is the, uh, the actual data item that I need to uh, work on. Uh, in this current work item. So first API here is the get work dimension, so that returns the number of dimensions. And of course, you know, this could be a one dimension or two dimension or three dimensions. And you can also get global size, so that will return the um, global number of work items in the dimension requested. If you have only one dimension, of course, this is gonna be uh, zero as the dimension ID, if you have two dimensions, so you can use either zero or one as the dimension ID. And then you can use get global ID uh, to return the index of the current work item in a global space and dimension. You supply the dimension as the uh, argument. Similarly, you can get the local size, essentially is the work group size, and also the ID within the work group. We can get the number of uh, work groups uh, or we can use this global size divided by local size, and that's the same as the number of groups. We can also get the group ID uh, using this uh, API, uh, supplying the dimension ID. Now let's look at this uh, very simple kernel example. Uh, this is a kernel function we define. Uh, it starts with underscore and underscore kernel as a keyword, and its return type is void, uh, and those are required. And the name of this kernel function is simple kernel. 
it takes two arguments. Um, first argument is a floating point buffer, and it's in the global buffer, global memory. And similarly, the second argument is another buffer. And these are the statements we have in this kernel function. We have a get global ID. Uh, so we'll first, we'll calculate the address. We use the get global ID to get the ID number in a global um, space uh, in, on dimension 0. And we will get the uh, global ID on dimension 1 and multiply that with the global size 0. And then we're going to use uh, this. Uh, uh, this is actual computation. So this we use the address as the index uh, to this array, and we will um, multiply that by two and assign the product into uh, buffer B. And the following here is the uh, actual code we will use to launch this kernel. And here we use q dot and the range kernel. By the way, this is a C++ binding, so the uh, syntax here is a little different from the C binding we have been used so far, been using so far. Uh, what we're saying here is that we're going to use this kernel. Uh, we're going to uh, use uh, um, we're going to use two dimensions, uh, and the first dimension for global range is 10, for local range is 5, and we will not wait for any event, but we'll generate this event. So if you look at this problem space, uh, we actually have a 10 by 10 um, kind of matrix um, well, to, to um, If you look at this diagram here, we use this two-dimension uh, matrix to illustrate the um, size of the problem. And this is actually the, um, you can think about each box here is the element in buffer A. So what we end up doing here is that we're trying to uh, locate the actual item, the actual element in this within this buffer A, and we will do the computation, multiply by 2, and assign the uh, value to a different buffer. So the key point here, well, key step here is to first figure out for this current work item, which element I should be working on. Now, why is that important? Because uh, we want these work items to cover the whole problem space. That's one thing. The second thing is we don't want the work items to compute on the same element twice because that's a waste of time, waste of uh, CPU cycles or GPU cycles. So that's why it's important to uh, figure out the address. And by using this global ID in dimension 0, we will be able to figure out this, all of this out of this row, which item I'm going to be calculating on. The second part of the computation for doing uh, getting the address, we use global ID 1, which is the row number, and global size 0, which is the row size. So actually, we're going to count how many rows we have gone through so far. So this first part here is to say which element in the row, well in fact that's the column ID, and the second part of this address computation is to figure out how many rows I've gone through so far, because this get global ID 1 will give you the row number. And in this case, uh, we are talking about uh, row number um, no, 3, so this is going to be row number 3 here. And we're going to do the second element. Okay. Um, so in, in fact, this should be uh, row number 3 that's going to be here. 
um, it's pointing out to the pre precise location. And similarly, this is row number seven, and this is you know within this row we're talking about uh, element number six, so we're counting from zero. OpenCL synchronization. OpenCL, by its design, is a cross-platform API framework uh, and cannot guarantee hardware-based ordering. Because OpenCL doesn't really know eventually this program, the OpenCL program, where it will be executed. So it will be hard for the um, platform itself uh, to guarantee hardware-based ordering uh, for, by the time you design the program. So OpenCL runs uh, on device, and the device could support hardware threading uh, in the case of GPU. Uh, it could be uh, a CPU that supports um, OS-managed multi-threading. Um, but the additional um, consideration is in place to enable full concurrency. For the case of CPU uh, on a x86, uh, it is possible to uh, lower a semaphore or block if the semaphore is unavailable, uh, knowing that the operating system will remove the threat from it at the execution uh, at some later um, moment. Uh, it is the special case for general purpose uh, CPU uh, plus operating systems that you can have this assumption of semaphore and blocking using some of force. However, uh, for devices, uh, including GPU and FPGA, or other OpenCL compute units, there's no operating system running separately on such a device. So it means that there's no masters uh, or OS kernel to remove threads from an uh, execution queue if it is blocked on waiting resources, for example, using semaphore uh, and mechanisms like this. Uh, let's say if you have a GPU, uh, you have uh, threads that are running on these GPU cores, and these threads, there's no master or slave per se, uh, where the master can have a full control, higher priority than the other threads, and removing a thread. Uh, from a GPU does not free its resources. So there's a risk of uh, deadlock. Um, and this is the case where the kernel is not ready to run, but it is required to free the semaphore, if a semaphore is used. Um, and this is uh, the major difference between a CPU-based uh, platform and a GPU or FPGA-based uh, platform. So in order for uh, us to perform um, advanced synchronization uh, among the work items, uh, we can use a special uh, mechanism uh, called workgroup barrier. OpenCL defines only the global synchronization between one, one work item and another. Uh, there's no specific methods of ensuring watering uh, if two work items are in the different work groups uh, of the same kernel execution. So this um, means that if you are trying to uh, perform synchronization on two work items who belong to different work groups, uh, then OpenCL uh, does not have such uh, mechanisms to support that. If you think about the from the hardware perspective, uh, these different um, these work items belonging to different work groups, when they are mapped to the hardware, they are mapped to different compute units. Now I want to recall that the concept uh, of the uh, work item work group. Uh, versus the concept of processing elements and compute unit. So just try to visualize in your mind that the how these two uh, different hierarchy of uh, work uh, workloads and also hierarchy of hardware resources are uh, corresponding to each other. 
Now, to support sharing of data, especially when we talk about uh, within the work group or on the same compute unit where we have local memory accessible to uh, all the processing elements, we can do something to um, synchronize the work items in the same work group. And for this purpose, we use the barrier operation. So the barrier operation is the uh, key operation that we can leverage to synchronize between work items within the same work group. A call to barrier within a work item requires that work item cannot continue past the barrier until all the other work items in the work group have also reached the barrier. Now let me give you a visual uh, representation of this concept. Let's look at the uh, kernels. We have a kernel Q0 and a kernel Q1, or you think about this, this is the kernel uh, that we are going to execute. And at runtime, we will um, create or launch the kernel in terms of work groups. And we have, in this case, four work groups. And within a work group, we can have multiple work items. In this case, we have eight work items uh, within this work group. Actually, in each of these work groups, we have eight work items. Let's just focus on this work group zero. Now, at time of the execution, we start all the eight work items. So we have them mapped onto the processing element of a compute unit and they start to uh, execute their instructions. Now, they are executing the same instructions, but on different processing element. And depends on the, for example, the memory access latency, and these work items may proceed at different speed or at different pace. Okay, And these square boxes that each work item has, this is the barrier uh, instruction or barrier API that they are calling within their work item. And what this is going to have on these uh, work items is that they will use these APIs, these barrier APIs, as a synchronization point. So this line here is actually the barrier. Uh, and these work items will not proceed until all the other work items in the same work group reaches this point, this, this point, until all the other work items reach this point. So no matter how fast or how slow these each work items proceeds, they will end up reaching to this barrier eventually at the same time and only after that they will continue their execution until they reach the other uh, barrier instructional API. Okay, and so this, this shows that barrier is the synchronization between the work items in the same work group. It has no effect on the other work items in the other work groups. Well, if you look at the bigger picture, uh, this line here, this is the global synchronization, uh, where we can use the uh, event and wait event to uh, synchronize uh, in, at this global scale. But within the work group, at the work items level, we need to use barrier instructions to uh, perform that synchronization. Now let's look at the implementation. Here we have a uh, few memory objects that we create, input, intermediate, output. And we have a write buffer command that we want to uh, insert or enqueue to the command queue. Uh, and we're using blocking uh, write operation. And next we are initializing the kernel arguments 
and we will do CL in queue and derange kernel to in queue this kernel into the command queue. Now you can see here we have no uh, wait events and we don't generate any event. Similarly, this second time we uh, create a kernel, this kernel uh, is uh, in queued to the command queue and ready to be launched. And finally, we have this read buffer uh, where we have a blocking read. We will retrieve the final result from the output buffer on the device to the uh, host output buffer. And next, we're going to look at the kernel function. The kernel function uh, is named simple kernel. And it takes three arguments, uh, two are pointers or memory objects. And they are in the global memory. And the third argument is actually uh, another memory object, but it's in the local memory. Now, this is the first time you see this underscore underscore local, which indicates that this argument points to a memory object that is in the local memory. Now ask yourself, where is the local memory? Local memory is present within a compute unit. And local memory is shared by the processing elements uh, in that compute unit. All right, so let's look at what we are doing in this kernel function. First, we will use uh, the global ID uh, in the first dimension, dimension 0. We'll use that as an index to get the numbers from this buffer A, which is in the global memory. And we're going to assign the value uh, to the corresponding element in the local buffer. And I'm using this, uh, again, dimension 0, but I'm using now the local ID. Now, Let's stop here for a moment. Now, we have only one line of this statement. But keep in mind, this is in the kernel function. And when the kernel is put into the command queue, launched on the device, the, there could be multiple instances of this kernel execution. So at runtime, there will be multiple work items working on the same uh, assignment uh, statement trying to read data from the global memory and put that into the corresponding location in the local memory. Now for this particular work what we want to do is we want to wait until all the work items have read the data and it becomes available in the local memory. So that's our purpose. And in future classes, we'll show you an example. Indeed, we require this kind of um, barrier operation to synchronize all the work items. So this is our goal. And the way to do that is by using work group barrier. And we're using, in particular, this local memory fence uh, as a synchronization point. And you can choose a different memory uh, fence, for example, global memory fence and that will use a different um, uh, memory controller as the synchronization point. So every work item will execute this line, and they will not proceed until all the work items reach to this line. And after that, if the work item is about to execute this following line, that means all the other work items in the same group reach that same, same line. And the next uh, operation will be uh, we're going to uh, compute the other address and we'll perform the uh, operation, which is to uh, add uh, the data in the local buffer. Uh, we're going to get from the local ID. Uh, and also, we're going to get from the other address um, the data at the other address, but both of these are from the local buffer. And we're going to add these two, and the sum will be sent, uh, stored into the um, corresponding location in the resulting outputting buffer B in the global memory. As you can see here, 
because we are using the data uh, in the global sorry in the local buffer and we will use multiple data in the local buffer and that's why we have to wait until all the reads uh, finish uh, so that we are sure all the data we're going to read from the local buffer are valid data and that's the reason why we need this barrier operation native kernel native kernel is something uh, unique that can help people uh, quickly uh, perform certain functions the purpose of native kernel is to enqueue standard C functions for execution on a device so instead of writing a open CL kernel uh, we optionally can have a C function and we use that function as a native kernel and we're going to enqueue that kernel and then we're going to execute that function on a device and of course, we assume that this C function is uh, compiled with the device native compiler. Uh, so we don't have to rely on the OpenCL compiler uh, to generate uh, the uh, program object uh, based on OpenCL kernel functions. Now, the, the um, API here is uh, as follows. It's CL enqueue native kernel. And we're going to use the command queue uh, associated with the target device. And you're going to supply the user function. This is the, the C function uh, we uh, want to use as a native kernel. Now, the next a few, uh, I think one, two, three, four, five, these five arguments are actually uh, the, the mechanisms for transferring or passing the arguments from the OpenCL environment to this C function. And we're going to have an example of the, these arguments uh, in the next slide. But uh, before we talk about that, you can see this enqueue native kernel also takes a wait list um, event and number of events. And also, it can generate an event associated with this kernel. Uh, regarding the passing the arguments, we use a, a scheme called unboxing. Uh, this is to helpful. Um, this is to help us to handle the open CR objects. Let's look at this example. Uh, we now have a native function, so you can see here, this one does not have underscore underscore kernel uh, as the starting keyword. Uh, it's a void type of function, and it takes a one argument, and this is the pointer to the uh, argument uh, bundle or, or blob that you can think about, think of. And we have a command queue, uh, and it's created using CL create command queue. And we have three memory objects buffer 1, buffer 2, and an image. So these are the objects we hope to pass into this uh, user um, function implemented in C. And in addition to these three arguments, we would like to also pass in two numbers. One is 5, and the other one is 8. So if you look at this diagram for, at this moment, this is what uh, we expect to pass into this function for. This full function takes uh, five arguments. The first one and the third one are two constant numbers. And the second one, fourth one, and the fifth one, these are three um, pointers to the memory object, to the memory buffer that we want to pass into. And these buffers are OpenCL buffers. So the goal of using these uh, memory objects and memory list, these five arguments, is to help us to retrieve these buffer objects from the OpenCL environment and use that in our C function. Uh, 
So let's see how we uh, achieve this goal. First, we define an array of pointers. And this args uh, has five elements. And each of the elements is a pointer. And what we're doing here is we're actually uh, putting five and eight as the first and third uh, element in this array. This is, in fact, the uh, integer 5, integer 8 that we wish to pass into this uh, user function foo. And the other three functions, sorry, the other three pointers are the ones we need to supply. First, we want to um, tell the um, incunative kernel API how many memory objects we want to pass in. Now, the reason we differentiate memory objects uh, with other const numbers is that for other numbers, we can pass in directly. But for memory objects, we need to do something as an indirective passing. So this way, here we're saying the number of memory objects is 3. And we're about to pass in 3 memory objects. And we're going to put these memory objects in this memory objects list. So you can see here, we have a list with three elements in this list, and buff1, buff2, and image. So these are the three memory objects we created earlier. And the next line is to um, basically tell the uh, incunative kernel API, where is my argument location? In our case, we wish to pass in this memory arguments as the second, fourth, and fifth argument. So if you look at the index, this is going to be index 1, index 3, and index 4 out of all the five arguments that we should pass into the function for. So here we're saying these three memory objects we're going to be passing in to the function in this index 1, index 3, index 4, at these three um, locations, or the three um, different arguments as the uh, out of the five. And then, once this is done, you can call the CL incunative kernel, and you will supply the command queue, the name of the native kernel, the args, which is the um, list of the arguments, and this includes the constant numbers, and also uh, placeholders for those memory objects. And we give the size of the argument, and then we tell that the number of memory objects is 3, and these are the three memory objects, buff1, buff2, and image, and the locations in the uh, args in this bundle here, this location is index number 1, number 3, and number 4. And uh, for the wait list, we do not wait for anything, any other events, uh, nor we generate any event. So this way, what we end up doing is, we put these three memory objects into this memory list, and we tell the inq native kernel that these memory objects will be supplied as args index 1, args index 3, and args index 4. So they will be uh, put into this corresponding uh, locations in the args list. So this is going to be buffer 1, buffer 2, and this is going to be the image object. So it's a little bit involved, but in this way, we can pass in the um, OpenCL memory objects to this user function. Built-in kernel. Built-in kernels are device-specific kernels. So that's why built-in kernels are not universal. Some devices have built-in kernels, uh, some devices don't. And even for devices with built-in kernels, they will may not have the same kernel function. The purpose of built-in kernels 
is to leverage special hardware resources present on the device. And these kernel functions are not built at runtime from source code. Uh, instead, uh, they are ready to be used, uh, and they uh, they to uh, they are used to expose fixed function hardware acceleration or embed firmware functions. Uh, one example of built-in kernel is Intel's motion estimation extension uh, for OpenCL. And this is for image processing, uh, where you want to estimate the motion uh, between uh, neighboring frames uh, in the video frame. For more details, you can refer to this website uh, to understand about this extension.